Good evening, everyone. It's, I, my name is Kate Younger. I'm the director of, research director of our project Ukraine and European Dialogue here at the IWM. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all tonight on behalf of the IWM, and in particular, our re rector, Shalini Randeria, who couldn't make it tonight, but sends her regards. Tonight's lecture, like the conference it's part of, has been a long time in the making. And the first thing I want to do before we go any further is to thank our partners who've helped make this possible. First and foremost, that's our institutional partners, the Ukrainian Institute and the Center for Urban History in Lviv, but also the team here at the IWM. In the room tonight, my colleagues, Lydia Akrasha and Nikki Kshonzhek, who've made this possible. So thank you all very much. Tonight's lecture is the keynote part of our conference that's ongoing here at the IWM right now. Between Kiev and Vienna, histories of people, ideas, and objects in circulation and motion. This conference is part of the wrap-up of a very full of year of events in the framework of the Bilateral Cultural Year Austria-Ukraine 2019, which has been a wonderful occasion to bring lots of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian events here to Vienna, and we've all been very delighted to be able to take part in those. When we were thinking about this conference, we started from the premise that it's quite limiting to speak of U Austria and Ukraine in a bilateral format, especially when the two countries have only existed in their current forms for a relatively short period of time. But connections between these countries are part of, and indeed typify, a broader history of, mo of movement across this space. So we've gathered over 30 scholars here at the IWM to rethink the history of this region through the lens of circulation and motion. And we're lucky enough that this keynote is actually in the middle of our conference after two wonderful full days of discussions, which will continue tomorrow morning, so you're welcome. I'll soon have the, we'll soon have the pleasure to hear from our speaker, Serhii Plochi, but first I want to mention three ways you can continue tonight's engagement with the topic of Ukraine in an innovative way. The first of those is right here in this building. After the lecture, we'll have wine and cheese and a reception down in the IWM cafeteria. But in addition to socializing there, please feel free to explore the really amazing exhibition that's in the stairwell of the, photographer, of the photography of Alexander Chakmenyov, curated by our friends Elisa Lojkina and Konstantin Akinsha. There's more information about the exhibition in the stairwell itself. Please feel free to take a leaflet. It extends all the way up to the fifth floor of the building. So please do feel free to explore. Secondly, I just want to quickly mention that tomorrow night at Moot at 8 p.m., you're warmly invited to a performance of East West Street, A Song of Good and Evil, based on Philippe Sand's book of the same name. It's a concertante lesung of image, narrative, and music about the lives of Raphael Lemkin, Herr Slaudopacht, and Hans Frank. And last but not least, we couldn't let Serhii and Philippe escape without putting them to work again. So on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. at Café Bookshop Zinger near Schwedenplatz, we'll be hosting a conversation between these two recent Bailey Gifford Prize winners on the topic of humanity and catastrophe. Please do join us there. Now to the main attraction. It's a true honor to be able to introduce Serhii Plochi tonight. He's Mikhail Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard University and the director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. His wide-ranging work has had a huge impact on all of us who deal with Ukrainian history from the early modern period to the collapse of the Soviet Union and everywhere in between. He combines a remarkable talent for storytelling with an exceptional ability to synthesize complex historical developments. Because in addition to everything else he does, that he is also an astoundingly prolific writer, tonight he will not be talking about his latest book, which has come out since we invited him, and which tells a fascinating episode in the history of World War II, Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front. You'll find this book for sale at a book table in the, front, in the reception area if you want to know more about that. Instead, we've asked him to reflect on his previous book, Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy, which came out in 2018. In a way, the Chernobyl environmental disaster is a crucial part of the history of circulation and motion between Kiev and Vienna and the spaces in between. And so he will tell us more about that. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Serhii for his lecture, tonight entitled Atomic Energy and the Arrogance of Man, Revisiting the Chernobyl Nuclear Disaster. Thank you, Serhii. Well, uh, Kate, thanks a lot for this wonderful introduction and uh, thank you to organizers of this conference for putting it together and also for inviting me. It's, it's a great pleasure. And with Kate, we were just discussing how many years passed since she, she graduated from Harvard. We, we are now accustomed, uh, as impeachment goes on, to see our graduates from Alex Widman to uh, to, to a number of others, and 
Again, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> graduates are in, an escape, you can't escape really, you can, you can, you can uh, run but you cannot hide and I'm, I'm really, I'm really very pleased, uh, Kate, to, to see you, thanks. Uh, what uh, I'm going to talk today is really related to my, um, uh, not latest book, but the, look, uh, the book that uh, certainly got a lot of attention, the book on Chernobyl. And uh, uh, I will try to reflect on the history of disaster in a little bit different way from the way how I do that in the book. Uh, the book is really there is a story and there is an argument and I will try to focus on argument uh, at the expense of the story. So there will be no nail biting kind of a situation. So okay, whether the reactor explode or not and what will happen, whether this or that character would survive. So we'll, we'll skip that. And uh, another, another thing that I'm going to do is to talk about Chernobyl in a, a quite broad international context. Uh, my book, and, and again, most of my work before that is of course focused on Ukraine, Eastern Europe, Soviet history, pre-Soviet. So it, it is, the book on Chernobyl is really very much grounded in the place, in the place and time. And place and time are both Soviet at that time. And it's sometimes very easy to dismiss the entire story of Chernobyl as something that was produced by a particular time and circumstances. And once communist ideology is gone, the Soviet Union is not there, and the, the bureaucracy that, that, that was responsible for that and, and particular culture allegedly is gone, we can, we can move on. That's really something that belongs to the past. Uh, one of the arguments that I will be trying to make today that again Chernobyl it's not only the pa about the past. It is very much about our present and I hope it is not about our future and that's, that's, that's the, 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 the argument of the story. And uh, of course uh, the, the story of Chernobyl is, is international just uh, in the way how it was happening. One of the observers at the time said that really the Cold War came, uh, or at least the Berlin Wall came to an end and, and became irrelevant with Chernobyl because radiation could, could, cross, could cross boundaries. And uh, before just coming here, I checked the, the latest data because again, it's, we historians know the truth and it stays with us forever. Scientists keep changing their opinion. So the, the, latest, the latest data is that 2% uh, that, uh, apparently of cesium-137, one of the most harmful uh, um, isotopes produced by Chernobyl, landed up here in Austria. So that's, that's just one of the examples of, of uh, the international, international context. Another, of course, uh, another uh, important international part of the story is, uh, is the fact that in Vienna <laughs> since 1957, we have an in, uh, international atomic agency, uh, uh, energy agency, which was a very important part of, of uh, certainly Chernobyl's story. Uh, both in, in good way and in a bad way. And I'll talk about the, the both, both uh, 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 cases uh, as, as we'll be moving on. And this is a slide to, uh, the quality is not great, but the slide to illustrate the, the fallout uh, of uh, um, one of the isotopes in Europe and as you can see here, this is, this is the 30 kilometer exclusion zone, which is by now international by, by its nature. It's divided between uh, Ukraine and Belarus, even those 30 kilometers, they're divided. But this is, this is actually much more proof of the international, international character of the disaster. Uh, before we'll go into, into the... Um, mm, uh, mm, mm, parts of the, of the Chernobyl story that I think relevant not just for the Soviet experience but for the, for the experience of the humankind with nuclear energy as a whole. <coughs> I want to say a few words about, about what actually, or rather, rather remind you about what happened in Chernobyl. So uh, it was uh, the night of April 26, 1986. It was a night shift uh, uh, that uh, came, uh, th started at 12, 12 a.m. 
and the expectation of those people were that the task that uh, they were supposed to run during the previous day would already be done, would be gone, and the reactor would be, would be shut down. The reactor was not shut down for a number of reasons, and uh, 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 less than two hours into that new shift, the reactor actually exploded. They, 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 they lost control over it. Um, mm, again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, exactly how that happened and what went into that. Uh, but uh, there are different estimates. And again, the, 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 the scientists are still arguing about uh, the, the immediate causes of the, of the explosion. This is now more than 30 years later. There are still theories appear that, okay, say not, not, the, the, there were two explosions, but which one happened, which one was hydrogen, which one was a different kind, is still, is still debated. How many, how many um, um, uh, um, isotopes and radiation was released is also still discussed because that depends also, or this is closely related to the fact how much of that fuel, spent fuel, uh, is now sitting in Chernobyl. The original uh, data that was given by the Soviet Union was 5%, and uh, uh, it seems to me 5% is listed in my book. Since then, I kind of was uh, digging a little di deeper, and again, th there is no consensus, but as the idea is being discussed of removing that fuel, they try to figure out how much fuel is there. And now the, the, the latest uh, uh, estimates are that over 50% actually escaped and there is maybe 30% or something like that of fuel that is still there that would have to be extracted. Uh, but one way or another, the, the, within the next few days, the, the half of Europe was covered with uh, radiation. And uh, if the original, original response was denial on the part of director, on the part of operators, eventually the, 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 the realization of what happened Synced, and uh, uh, it was an enormous effort, enormous effort on the part of the Soviet Union at that time to deal with the consequences, and 600,000 people were mobilized to, to deal with that issue. Um, Chernobyl had, had, of course, it's still today in terms of the amount of radiation released is the, the biggest nuclear catastrophe in the world. Fukushima got close, but not, not, uh, uh, not, not surpassed Chernobyl in, in that sense. And especially given that a lot of radiation released by Fukushima was really by the wind was moved to the ocean. And somehow we believe that radiation in the ocean is all fine and good. <laughs> Uh, and, and radiation after Chernobyl really covered densely populated areas of Europe. That's, that's another, another thing to consider. Uh, now, uh, mm, some of you probably heard that uh, uh, in the last few years, Ukraine passed uh, the so-called decommunization laws. Uh, some of you heard, others maybe heard too, too much, others come from, from trenches of that war. Uh, we at Harvard, uh, at, at Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, tried to, to, to map the, the, the decommunization. And uh, it was an interesting phenomenon in the sense that, as it can be predicted, there most of uh, renaming and, and then first toppling the, the monuments to Lenin and then renaming um, originally happened, happened in central Ukraine. Um, and then the rest of Ukraine, which is under under uh, Kyiv's control, under the government control today. But on our map, there is also uh, Donbass and there is also Crimea. Because in March and in February of uh, 2014, when the communization uh, or this um, uh, acts of symbolic violence, the, the, the uh, toppling of um, Lenin's monuments started, Crimea and Donbass were still part of that space of Ukraine. So there, there, are, uh, there are also uh, points on our map which include Crimea and Donbass. There is just one area where decommunization never took place, and this is Chernobyl. And this is Chernobyl zone. And uh, you can go there, you can see not only monuments to Lenin, you can also see the, the, the names of the streets, you, you can see the, the slogans that are there. And as I told earlier, 
it's now a, a kind of a, a kind of preserve which is um, functioning in a very interesting way. It, it is preserved there about, about uh, the particular disaster that had taken place, but it's also preserved, it's, it's, it's a time capsule. That's where the Soviet Union, to a degree that is still alive uh, uh, physically, it is, certainly, it is certainly very much alive there. And as I said earlier, it's really very easy to dismiss Chernobyl as, as a Soviet product and forget about it. Uh, well, uh, Chernobyl was a Soviet product, but it also had a lot, a lot of things that are common for the development of nuclear energy in the world in general. After uh, all, the Soviet Union was the, the one of the pioneers together with the United States in, in uh, uh, producing the bomb. Of course, some of that information was stolen. But uh, uh, then the, the, the very first uh, functioning, small but functioning nuclear power plant was built in the Soviet Union. Uh, technology was then later spread, including, including in Europe. Uh, so a lot of Soviet story is also the story of Europe and the story of the world. And in particular, the, the close interrelation between military program and the civilian program. And that's, that's works in different, in different countries in different ways. Uh, in the United States, uh, first there was a bomb, of course, like, like it was in the Soviet Union, but there was also a realization of the danger that comes with the, with the bomb. There was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and there was a debate that started by people like uh, um, uh, Norman Cousins and others already immediately on the, on the, on the second week after, after the explosion. So there was this sense of a danger that came with that, and when then President Eisenhower in 1953 uh, declared this program of atoms for peace, one of the reasons why it was there, not because US desperately needed another source of electricity, eventually it turned out that it was, it was quite handy, but the main reason was to calm the American public and the public all around the world that nuclear things are not just the bombs that explode, there is some good and positive thing to the development of of nuclear energy. So the, 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 the one way or another in the US they had, they had to deal with the danger posed by nuclear and that was part of public debate and discussion. In the Soviet Union that never happened. They were catching up. For them, for the people who built the bomb, who sacrificed very often their health, there was a wartime conditions. The idea was either we are catching up or we get nuked and in, in that sense the, 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 the beginnings, the beginnings of the nuclear energy and, and thinking about it were quite different. And um, the people, the people uh, responsible for creating of the bomb and creating of the uh, Chernobyl nuclear disaster is actually one, uh, the, the, same, the same people. And they happened to be, uh, they happened to be uh, here on this screen. I wonder if anyone can recognize any of these of this characters. Alexandro would be where? Left. Left. And this gentleman? <laughs> okay, okay. It's, it, 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 it's interesting. So it's, easy, it's not easy, but it's possible to, uh, to, to recognize Alexandro, but it's impossible to recognize his boss. Uh, th this gentleman's name was Yefim Slavsky. He was the most powerful minister that the Soviet Union had ever had. He um, was the minister of medium machine building, which was actually a Soviet uh, Manhattan project that was go going there in perpetuity. And uh, Afanasyev, uh, as, as the candidate for most powerful minister? Well, okay, we can, we can discuss that. <laughs> I, 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 I still consider Slavsky to be the most powerful, but again, there, there can be, there can be uh, uh, room for, 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 for uh, um, again, I, I'm prepared to change my mind if, if, I, <laughs> if, if the argument is good enough. Uh, so um, uh, why, why I, I'm talking about Slavsky as a as, uh, very powerful person? 
Well, uh, Mr. Alexandrov was, of course, the head of the, uh, uh, the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. He was also the director of the Institute of Atomic Energy. But the Institute didn't belong to the Academy of Sciences. It belonged to Mr. Slavsky's ministry. So Mr. Velikov and others who worked under Alexandrov would actually go and knock on the door of Mr. Slavsky asking, asking for money, asking for subsidy. Uh, and uh, um, those two, they worked on the, on the uh, military uh, uh, application of nuclear power already in the na uh, late 1940s and early 50s. Alexandrov was the uh, um, uh, ac scientific academic director of the, of the uh, um, RBM car reactors, the, 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 the graphite water reactors that turned out to be very dangerous that were built uh, uh, um, uh, in the Soviet Union. And of course, they were, uh, the, the whole project was supported by Slavsky's ministry and the first nuclear power plant that was built near then of city of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, with RBMK reactors, it actually belonged to Slavsky's ministry. And only after that, it was turned, it was turned to, to uh, the, the uh, Ministry of Energy. So, uh, Again, the, the connection between military and, 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 and civil, it's not so unique. In the United States, the, the, the most popular reactors, water water reactors, uh, are based on the reactors built for the, nuclear, uh, for, the, for the submarines. What, however, was part of culture in, in the Soviet nuclear industry, it was highly militarized, it was the, the conditions of the Cold War, of course, that information was highly uh, highly classified and kept secret from people, from people within the industry itself. And uh, uh, for Chernobyl, it had a very, very direct relation because the same type, uh, uh, physically speaking and technically speaking, the same type of accident as happened in Chernobyl in 1986 happened in at the uh, nuclear power plant uh, near St. Petersburg in 1975. And it uh, revealed for the first time in a major way problems that the RBM car reactors had. But that information actually was withheld from people in the industry. That was Ministry of Mr. Slavsky. The reactors went to the Ministry of Energy. That information never actually was discussed, never, n n never, never made available to the people who worked in Chernobyl. So their first reaction when that happened was that denial and partially de denial on the fact that they, they honestly didn't think that reactors actually can explode, that there can be a meltdown, despite the fact that one of those reactors already few years before that, in 1975, was already, was already on the, um, again, the, the, the Chernobyl didn't happen there, but again, all, almost by accident. Um, <clears throat> so the relation between military and, and uh, uh, nuclear civil, uh, atoms, atoms for war and atoms for peace is there. The big question is how, you, how do you handle them? They're, they're in the US, they're in the Soviet Union, they're in other places as well. And now uh, we have a, a situation in which, of course, uh, quite possible and quite uh, a number of countries already did that. That was India in particular and now Iran is another possibility is that it's a, the other way around, not from the bomb to nuclear power plant, but from nu nuclear power plant to to the bomb. And the next, the next um, frontier for the development of nuclear power is now the Middle East, the most volatile politically and otherwise, otherwise uh, area of the world. And that's where, th okay, you still can hear me, yeah? And that's, that's where the most of the, of the new um, reactors are uh, or will be built or at least are projected to be built. Now, let's, let's talk to, to another important part of that story, which is, again, uh, not unique for, for uh, Chernobyl. 
And that story is about nuclear power and, and uh, economy. And the fact that whether it was the Soviet Union or it was the United States or it was uh, Japan, the reactors are there to produce electricity. So to produce in, in the uh, market economy profit and in non-market Soviet economy to produce, uh, to, to meet the, the, um, uh, the, the, the quotas uh, and, and meet them in time before the end of the month, before the end of the year and so on and so forth. And uh, mm, the Soviet Union was actually uh, very aggressively developing uh, nuclear energy, uh, especially in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. A few months before the uh, Chernobyl nuclear disaster, um, mm, 27th Party Congress is the 27th, yes, 27th Party Congress took place in Moscow. So it was March of 1986. The reactor exploded in April of 1986. And they adopted at that, uh, Alexandra was one of the speakers there. And uh, they adopted the uh, mm, program for the development of uh, energy sector in general, but nuclear energy in particular. It was decided that within the next five year plan, the number of the reactors that actually would be completed would be twice compared to the number that were completed and uh, put uh, online, connected to the, to, to the grid in the previous five years. The reason for that, the, the 27th uh, uh, Party Congress was happening at the time when the word perestroika is not yet known. The key word, the key slogan at that time was uskarenie, which means acceleration. So the belief was that basically everything is okay and right with the, with the economic system, but you have to be younger, more vigorous, uh, spend more than three hours in office like it was under Brezhnev, and, and also uh, make right, right investments in terms of where the money go. Uh, and the, the key word was uh, the scientific technological progress. That's what was supposed to save the Soviet system, lift it out of the, of the decline in which it was at that time. And uh, uh, the embodiment of uh, scientific technological progress was of, course, was, of course, nuclear energy. So it's not only economic decision, it, it was also an ideological decision at the 27th Party Congress in terms of the rapidly, rapidly expanding nuclear, uh, nuclear industry in the Soviet Union. And uh, the, the reason was to meet, to meet the growing demand for, for energy. When uh, some of the operators at Chernobyl were interviewed after the accident and they were asked, why did you do this and that? Why you violated the, the uh, uh, safety, particular safety rules that were there? They told more or less what I told you before, said, okay, we didn't know that things like that can happen. We didn't know that reactors explode. But the worst thing that could happen in our mind is that actually we shut down the reactor without good reason for that, because that would mean actually the loss, the economic loss. That was the worst case scenario for us. And our task was actually to keep reactor going and to keep reactor working. Uh, otherwise, we could be fired. One, one of uh, uh, those operators who was interviewed, Kazichkov, said, well, of course, they wouldn't hire me just right away or for that particular reason, but they, 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 they would find the way how, how to do that. So again, the, 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 the economic, the, 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 the production of electrical energy, that was, that was the key. And for that, for that you uh, not just keep reactor going as long as possible, because uh, that's uh, exactly what was happening at Chernobyl as well. The, the, the way to uh, increase productivity was to limit the number of days and weeks and months when the reactor is there for a uh, scheduled maintenance. So that was one of the ways to deal with that. But another way to save money is, of course, to, to, to cut corners in terms of the, of the cost of the construction. And um, um, in the Soviet Union, there were two types of reactors, one that exploded in Chernobyl, another was more safe water-water reactor. 
uh, and uh, uh, but RBMK, uh, RBMK was was a favorite one because it was uh, cheaper to build it, and it was much more powerful. Uh, so the safer reactors were the reactors that were uh, exported to other countries, in particular to Eastern Europe and to Finland. RBM car reactors like the one in, in Chernobyl stayed at home. Uh, there, there were numerous problems, of course, with the, with the construction of the, of the uh, plant itself. Again, part of that was because of the saving, saving money, part of that was because of the way how the Soviet economy was functioning with shortages of everything. So if you don't have the right, the right uh, type of uh, product or equipment or something like that on time, you go with what you got at that, at, at that moment. And uh, in Ukraine, they, they just published uh, quite a huge volume of the KGB reporting on Chernobyl before the accident and after accident. And again, the, the good part of that volume is about the KGB officers in Chernobyl raising alarms about, about problems with the construction of the nuclear power plant. Again, Soviet story, but a story that is also that is also global, because the reactors are there to make money, to make profit. Uh, they are now in a situation where the nuclear energy is is not uh, after Chernobyl and and Fukushima. Uh, they are not really the, the the favorites of the of the societies as a whole. Some countries decide to go nuclear free altogether. So the industry as a whole is in a crisis. There is, of course, uh, increasing pressures that are coming from renewables and, and from shell gas and other things. Uh, in Ukraine, a few years ago, the workers were not paid and were going uh, on strike. Uh, and, and Ukraine continues to be the home for the uh, largest in Europe and it seems to me in the world nuclear power plant uh, near my home city of Zaporizhia. So when, when uh, it's the, 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 the economy is a very important part of the, of the nuclear industry, how it functions today, and especially when it functions under the kind of pressure that we have today. In the last two years, it seems to me, the, uh, the Western House and other, uh, another major company involved in, 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 in nuclear went bankrupt. Right? So the, this are not, these are not the best times for the industry. And again, at, the, at, that, at, that, at that particular time, it's really very important to, to keep in mind the, the pressures that economy, uh, demand for profit or otherwise, have, have on that industry. Um, mm, uh, this picture is here uh, to demonstrate to you, again, the way in which, in which the money is being saved uh, building building nuclear nuclear power plants. So uh, this is this is reactor number one that was built in the 1977. It seems to me it went online. This is reactor number two, and these are reactors four that exploded and three. So one uh, way to save the money was that the, the machine hole that these this, uh, reactors have, it's actually one and the same, which uh, is certainly, you, you save money with that, but also there was an enormous danger that the fire, once it started on reactor number four, that it would actually travel to all these other, to all these other units through mm -hmm through the uh, machine hall, which was full of oil and so on and so forth. And then it was discovered that also the, the roof of the reactor was built out of stuff that was actually capable of burning. And from that point of view, the role of, of uh, the first responders, the role of the firefighters was extremely important. Um, if the fire gets, gets to other reactors, it doesn't mean that they automatically explode or something terrible is happening. But short circuits is, of course, a very, very distinct reality, which means that the reactors could stay without uh, outside power. And what happens when reactors stay out without power? They don't have power to pump water, to, to uh, cold water to uh, deal with, with overheated, of course, reactor. And then they go in meltdown. So the, the uh, reactors without power, that's the story of Fukushima, basically. 
and that's, that, was, that, that was a real danger. Another, of course, another, uh, another uh, situation is here when it's the same really building again, it's cheaper to build, uh, having a duplex as opposed to, 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 to uh, standing alone home. So the same is with the reactors. And again, that, 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 that uh, eventually mm, didn't result in, in uh, any major problems with the, with the mm, third reactor, but again, that's, that's another thing to consider. Again, the story is not, is not just Soviet. Uh, why Fukushima eventually exploded? Well, because they, uh, the, 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 uh, it seems to me most or at least uh, uh, quite a few of nuclear power plants in Japan are built on the, uh, or close to the ocean shore because they need a lot of water. You see here, here there was an artificial lake created, a cooling pond. In Japan, there was a problem with water, so the, the water that they were using as, as a cooling water, they were using the uh, um, Pacific Ocean as a cooling pond, really, for, for, their, for their nuclear power plants. Again, it was uh, more feasible and it was cheaper. Again, we see that in Chernobyl, but that's, 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 that's a bigger story. Um, I talked already a little bit about the way that the, the nuclear energy and dangers of nuclear energy have been perceived differently in uh, the United States and in, uh, in the Soviet Union. And here I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about the, the, this public perception of nuclear in <coughs> in uh, two cultures and uh, as represented by two, two films. Uh, one is of course uh, nine days of one year. Don't know how many people here may be of, of the right age to, to watch it. Okay, or professionally interested. Uh, uh, and uh, with China syndrome, I guess more people are familiar with, with China syndrome. So the, 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 the Soviet film was first. And it's Alexei Batalov is there, loosely based on, on, on the, the, the story of Kurchatov, who dies young as a result of allegedly overexposure to, to radiation. And very roughly the story is that uh, he, is, he is a nuclear scientist who uh, was saving, it seems to me, a friend, was already irradiated. And then there is a love triangle. There is a woman that he loves, but it looks like she loves somebody else. Uh, an, another scientist, and uh, uh, our hero gets really upset and uh, uh, does another reckless thing, again, for some very good reason, and gets even more irradiated. And now he, they're preparing him uh, closer to the end of the film for, for surgery, for operation. It's not clear whether he would die, whether he would live or not, but he got the girl. She, she uh, decides that she will be staying with him. So he, he is rewarded for all these things and the fact that he was, he was uh, um, again, uh, getting, getting this radiation uh, is, is viewed as a right thing to do, as the right act. Again, it very much comes out of generally the, the, the uh, um, nuclear science ethos in the Soviet Union of the 40s and 50s, where it is, it is really the war. It is the war. Uh, we have to get the atomic bomb, we have to get the nuclear bomb, otherwise we will, we will, uh, will not survive the, the, the American attack. And that, 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 that attitude to a degree, uh, I can do that no matter what, attitude continued. The China Syndrome was released a few months before the Three Mile Island uh, accident in the United States. Uh, uh, mentioned, the Pennsylvania is mentioned there, but it's a different story. Jack Lemmon is another is a key character there, and he works at the nuclear power plant, and he realizes that the company that he works for is in violation of all sorts of safety procedures. He is struggling because he is a company man, his loyalty to the company, but eventually he is, he is concerned about the safety wins over and uh, he doesn't get to marry Jane Fonda, but he gets an interview with her. So he's, he's the main protagonist, he's the main uh, character, and that's, that's 
Uh, again, I, I don't want to push this too far, but again, that's, in my opinion, at least on, based on what I looked at, very much represents difference, difference in, uh, in culture. And that, that difference in culture in terms of that, okay, I can, I can do certain things, I can take risks, was a very much part of Chernobyl's story. Um, uh, you see here the mm, three, uh, there were altogether six people who were put on trial. It was a very Soviet trial in a way that it was an open, op they called it an open trial in a closed zone. So theoretically anyone could go there, but to get to the, they held it not in Kiev, they held it not in Moscow, they held it in, in the closed zone. So you can't, you can't really get there. And uh, now I mentioned already that key volume of the KGB materials. We now know that those people, when they were in prison, the, the people who were in the same cell with them were actually agents, state agents who were reporting on them and trying actually to influence the kind of testimony that those people were given, given at the trial. And um, mm, so this is the director of the plant, uh, uh, Mr. Burkhanov, who is portrayed as an embodiment of absolute evil in the, in the um, uh, mini-series. Uh, uh, he was quite a decent man, by the way, at least on, on the basis of what, what, what I read about him. I didn't interview him. Um, another, another embodiment of evil was, of course, Mr. Dyatlov. And, uh, uh, he was a decent man in, in, in his own right as well, but he was also someone who, who believed that uh, he, he actually knew more than anybody else. He was very kind of a Soviet type, tough manager. Uh, f uh, and uh, uh, the problem was that of course he didn't know a lot about the reactor, but this is Mr. Fomin, uh, the, the chief engineer. The reason why Dyatlov believed that he knew more than anybody else was that both Bruhanov and Fomin, they came actually from the, uh, uh, they, before coming to Chernobyl, they never dealt with nuclear energy as such. So th they didn't understand the physics of the reactor. They came from the um, uh, coal uh, type uh, uh, power, uh, power stations in, in Ukraine. Uh, Dyatlov, before he came to Chernobyl, he worked uh, uh, in the Navy in the Far East, but he worked with uh, actually smaller reactors. And uh, there is, uh, again, there is a significant literature, in particular dealing with Three Mile Island, because there it was the former Navy men who were, who were running the, the, the plant at that time. And there is significant body of literature discussing actually how small reactors behave differently from the big ones and how the experience that you get at the small reactor, which is safe but is, is, is very different from the, from the, uh, from the big and how, how you can cause, cause really a major, a major accident. So the, there, is a, there, there is a situation of the first generation of nuclear engineers. The younger guys who are coming up, they were already all trained. The, the, the top leadership is not trained at all. And this is something that one should keep in mind when we think about, about the expanding of nuclear in the, in the Middle East or in any, any new area. And that's, that's the, the, the type, the, how much experience the, the people who run those reactors are. But returning to the, to the issues of, of safety, what, uh, uh, Mr. Dyatlov, who was in charge of, of that test, and, and the test was, again, quite ironically, was there to improve the safety of the reactor. Uh, the question was that uh, uh, when they were shutting down the reactor and the emergency, emergency electricity were, uh, well, the electricity to run the reactor was coming from reactor itself, from, from the turbine. So when they were shutting that down, then the emergency generation of electricity would start. But there was a gap of a few seconds, and they were looking for the ways of how, of how to uh, uh, deal with that gap, experimenting whether after shutting of the reactor, the turbine is still works for a while, for a few additional seconds that can produce that electricity. And uh, they were trying to do that, that test before, but the equipment that they were using was not right. Now they had to do that. 
while the uh, for those of you who have uh, f uh, remembered the Soviet Union or visited uh, the 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 May first and then May nine holidays were coming. That was their last chance to do a Friday night. Either they do that now or they would have to wait for another uh, two weeks or three weeks because, uh, again, the, the, the right people would not be there, the, the permissions would not be given, the country was going on, 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 on vacation, uh, kind of a Christmas vacation in the middle of May. Uh, uh, and uh, they, were, they were actually pushing that to do that uh, as, as soon as possible. And um, because the crew that came was not supposed to deal with those issues uh, uh, in, in, in the night, they were inexperienced enough, they, they lost the, the, the level of energy in the reactor. So the reactor was out, technically was, was actually down at that time. But that's when uh, Mr. Jatlov appears and actually orders to revive the reactor that was, that was the, the, the uh, energy level was either low or zero or something like that. And in the process of doing that, they went under all the instructions and safety recommendations. They removed the absolute majority of the, um, um, of the uh, um, um, rods with, with which they controlled the reaction. It seems to me those were the boron rods. And uh, uh, once, once the reactor started to pick up um, uh, power and, and energy level, uh, there was not enough rods to, to regulate it. So it, it was, it, it's, it's a much more complex story. I tried to congest it. And also, I'm a historian, not a nuclear, nuclear physicist. But again, it's a much more complex story. In the end, they, they, they tried to shut it down. It was the scram button that, the, that they pressed. And uh, it didn't work out because the, the core of the reactor was already uh, overheated and those, those rods with the help of which they were trying to regulate it, they got melted and got stuck in the middle. Now, reactor exploded and uh, it wouldn't happen if uh, uh, there would be no violations of, the, of safety rules and procedures. All the systems were shut down because it was a test. But the argument that Yatlo was making, which was quite correct argument, that with all of that, taking all of that into account, if the reactor would not have these design problems that it had, and uh, there was a, a, a number of them. Uh, and again, the reactor was unsafe because it was graphite, and graphite, once it catches fire, the first time it happened in Britain in 1957, it's actually impossible, almost impossible to, to stop the fire. So whatever they were trying to do in Chernobyl, n n today's, today's belief is that nothing of that really mattered. Graphite was burning there as long as there was graphite. And then the, the mass, mass, uh, um, uh, um, dissemination of that, of that radiation, mass pollution ended when graphite was not there anymore, when it when it's got, got burned. So Detlef's position was if the reactor was wrong, there would be no explosion. And the both sides are right. So you have, you have these two things to come together for, for ex a Chernobyl type of explosion to happen. And uh, uh, again, that's, that's uh, uh, something that most of the people uh, today, especially who argue for the, for the development, continuing development of nuclear energy, sometimes for very good reasons. Again, climate is a major concern. Uh, they, they, they forget the, the, the human component of that, the, 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 the human story, because the argument goes, OK, there are no RBM car reactors anymore. There is a couple still running in Russia. But generally, there are, they, 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 they're phased out. There is a new generation. It's much safer. And we can just forget about that and move forward. But again, that the, 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 the human culture, uh, the, the factor and safety culture is really very important. And safety culture, again, that's something that can't be parachuted. That it is not something that <coughs> can be taught. That's something that, that really, really develops over a period of time. So you can't just order it on, on Amazon. Um, what is happening there? OK, I, I still have some time. Um, uh, 
probably uh, that will be that 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 will be my um, final big point, and that's about the Soviet Union as authoritarian state. Again, important point given I mentioned already um, the the Middle East, uh, and and we certainly can talk about about. Uh, China and we can talk about Russia today. Uh, uh, authoritarian states are, are uh, very good at doing certain things and they're terrible at doing other things. And um, the, the terrible thing that the authoritarian state was doing there is of course withholding information. First about the problems with the reactor from the people in the industry and then withholding information on what happened there from the rest of the population. Authoritarian states are not the law abiding and, and not, not, not the states in which people go according to the book. Uh, th th there is interesting comparison done between Chernobyl, uh, Chernobyl uh, Three Mile Island and Fukushima and how the different governments and different political systems react differently to the disaster. And um, in, in the Soviet case, uh, in, in the case of Chernobyl, uh, it really doesn't matter what the laws and regulations are. What matters is the decision that is made at the very top. So anything that would happen in Chernobyl of any significance after the explosion would have to be approved or come from the very top. Uh, the, the, once the government commission led by Sherbina, who is now Boris Sherbina, who was not un, much known but now is known after the miniseries, comes there, Bruhanov and all this leadership, all, all this uh, chief engineer and everyone else, they are removed. The decision to made, uh, to made uh, formally removed later, but in reality they are they, not running the show anymore. The, the decision to evacuate uh, Pripyat was made uh, not even, even Sherbina didn't have power to do that. He had to go all the way to the top. He says that it was the, uh, uh, leader, uh, the, the head of the Soviet government, Nikolai Rushkov, who gave, who gave a permission to do that. So that's the, and once the Chernobyl happens, KGB cuts, cuts the uh, telephone lines to the city. So the, 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 the controlling information, that becomes the main the main task of the, of the Soviet secret police at that time, with all sorts of course of consequences, with all sorts of, of spreading of spreading um, uh, rumors. Well, the, the probably the, the the symbol of this disregard to the human human uh, health and and fate of fellow citizens, it's of course the Kiev parade on May the first, uh, 1986 where, at least according to, to the data that is available to me, Gorbachev personally orders uh, Sherbitsky, the, the head of the Communist Party at that time, to do the parade, or you will put your party card on the table. Um, at, the, at the moment when the, 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 the levels of radiation are rising. Why it is done? Because the most important thing for the authoritarian state, it's, it's prestige and it's prestige on the international arena. The most important thing inside it's actually control over the population. And uh, again, it's, th there are some delays with releasing information both in the US and in, in uh, Japan, but they're, they're quite negligent. The management behaves itself more or less the same how it behaves in, in, in Chernobyl, like Bruhanov, for example, that they're trying actually to give the best possible scenario to people up there because they would be kept responsible for that. So there are very clear parallels on, the, on that level of management. But when you got upper, the, 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 the decisions are very different. In Fukushima, the director of the plant actually was running the whole, uh, uh, the, the whole plant through the entire crisis that took, it seems to me, close to one week. At least there were three or four days they were exploding one reactor after another. Uh, they were not removed. When Prime Minister flew to, to, to uh, the area, he was later accused of meddling and actually that was used politically against him. Uh, probably Gorbachev was afraid of that. He visited the nuclear power plant three years after the explosion, so no one could <laughs> accuse him of meddling in, into those affairs, but, but all the, the key decisions were made at the very, at the very top. 
So this uh, this uh, very bad things that come with with authoritarian state, with control over the over the uh, information channels, with the control of the population. There are also potentially good things that eventually turn not so good again in, in the authoritarian state. And that's, that's something that has to do with this image. And it's uh, the, the so-called roof cats, the people who are sent into most dangerous places. But uh, no one, by the way, like in the miniseries, was threatening them to drop them from the helicopter or some, something like that. People were really felt that that was their responsibility. They were supposed to be there. They did the shift on, on whose on who's, uh, uh, eyes that, that whole thing exploded. They didn't want to go, to go back. Uh, the, the, first, the, the first person who died from the radiation, um, again, he's not part of this pantheon of the, of the firefighters, and his name escapes me right now. Um, no, no. Well, the, the two people were dead as part of the explosion, but then when the liquidators were there. It's not Perry Washington, it's, it's, it's something like that, but it's, again, I, 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 I would have to consult my own book. <laughs> um, but what happens there is that he is there on the first night. He got the, the level of radiation that was above then was permissible, despite the fact that it was all, almost uh, from five, they raised it to 25 ram. He goes to the hospital and then he runs away from the hospital to join his crew and work there and gets, gets so it's, it's really nine days of one day battle of type of a situation just right there. This is, that, that's where he's supposed to be. He, he, his health is secondary, everything is secondary. So again, people, people uh, uh, who, who were related to the, to the plant were really quite heroic. Uh, but altogether, as I mentioned, there were 600,000 people who were mobilized and sent into the most dangerous place, not at that time. One resource that the Soviet Union had and could control was people, and people were sent there. Today, we don't believe that actually that amount of people was needed. Uh, the, the, uh, we don't, uh, not just don't believe, we know that of course there was no monitoring of the health of what was going on there. There were major problems even with getting information on how much radiation those people would, would get. Uh, uh, so again, we, we, we deal with the same, with the same ability of the, of the authoritarian state of mobilizing resources, sometimes quite effectively, of the entire country. And this mobilization, resources, uh, mobilization of the resources is happening not just at the expense of the, of the population, but it actually harms the population. And uh, so from that point of view, again, maybe there is just one monument to Lenin left in Chernobyl and, and the, the communist as ideology is not going through its best days possible. But the, the Chernobyl, again, it's not just about ideology. It's not just about the Soviet Union. It's also about the forms of government. It's about culture. It's about uh, e economy and economic development. Um, I guess I will skip. Uh, no, I will not skip. I'll say a few words and then, and then I'll conclude. And I, I can, uh, that will be a teaser. You can ask me more about, about those, th th those slides that I didn't have much time to talk about. Uh, we don't know whether this skull actually, whether it has anything to do with Chernobyl or not. The photo was taken uh, in the Narodichi area near Chernobyl, um, the area which is not part of the 30 kilometer zone. But uh, the 30 kilometer zone is quite deceiving in a sense. There are areas that are as clean or maybe cleaner than Vienna within, within 30 kilometer zone. They're very, da very dangerous and very dirty ones. And it all depended on the direction of the wind. And there are very dirty areas outside of the zone. And Narodichi was one of them. And uh, uh, once, once the story of Narodichi became known, uh, journalists when their films were done and, and uh, the, the attention was attracted to the, to the impact of Chernobyl on human health, on uh, our ecological system. And till today, it's more than 30 years later, we really don't know what should be attributed to Chernobyl, what not. 
the number of people who died from, uh, from uh, acute radiation syndrome, we know the number. It's, again, it's uh, uh, dependent on how count, but between 30 plus and 50 plus, but a relatively limited number. Two people died as the result of the explosion, per se. But other, you can Google, and the data would be between four or 5,000 additional deaths to norm, to 90,000, which means we really don't know. And uh, uh, what, what is Chernobyl from the, from the point of view, scientific point of view, in terms of the fallout? It's the, the fact that uh, low dosages of radiation have on human and, and on, on, on plants and so on and so forth, on animals, over a long period of time. We know a lot about nuclear bomb because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki what the uh, mm, significant amount of radiation released over a short period of time has on, on the human being. And we know that not uh, because it's easier to understand or more obvious, but because there was a major international study done for a long period of time to assess what is happening there. That study was never done on Chernobyl. Uh, partially with the help of the, uh, sorry, Vienna-based uh, international, uh, international Atomic uh, Agency, Energy Agency. Uh, the the uh, program was promoted by the UN Health Organization, but in the UN packing order, UN Health Organization is actually less significant than International Atomic Energy. And International Atomic Energy is there responsible for two things at the same time for promotion the peaceful use of nuclear energy and for controlling and policing that industry at the same time. So there is just a conflict of interests inbuilt in the industry, in, in, in the agency itself. And this is actually our best hope today. That agency is our best hope because uh, the, the I'll, I'll, I'll go there and maybe stop here. I will not talk about the fall of the Soviet Union because that's, that, that is a big part of the, of the book. I can talk about that if, if you ask, but that's a little bit outside of my, my kind of international, international impact of Chernobyl. So um, they, uh, this year just finished the construction of the, um, of the new uh, um, sarcophagus, of the, of the new shelter. Uh, the, the price tag is um, it seems to me 1.5 billion, uh, mostly paid, uh, not by the countries that, that actually uh, were part of the Soviet Union and technically can be kept to different degree responsible for what happened. Uh, Russia contributed something like 60 million, uh, Kazakhstan it seems to me one or two million, Ukraine uh, uh, um, contributed a lot partially in, in not in monetary form, but, but in other forms. But the main money actually came from, from Europe, from Japan, and from the United States. The nuclear disaster and its consequences is just too big of a disaster for a country like Ukraine, for example, today, or Belarus that shares the, the doesn't share the reactor, but shares the the um, exclusion zone. It's too big of a, of a thing to deal with. So at the end of the day with Ch Chernobyl's, it's the international community as a whole picks up the bill for that. And uh, that raises very important questions about the, 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 the uses uh, of nuclear energy because it's a sovereign state of an independent state to decide whether they want or don't want to build nuclear power plant. It's, it's uh, in certain circumstances, is a big boost to economy. Uh, for, for the Western countries or for the countries of the former Soviet Union to go to the third world countries and say, okay, we, we don't want to build nuclear power plants because we don't know you, you got the wrong culture and you, you got this and that. Well, that would be super selfish. It's after, after the, the, the West and, and the First and the Second World developed their nuclear industry and, and had these this accidents. 
So there is a sovereign right to build the plant, but when something goes wrong and, and gets, of course, profits from there. But if something goes wrong, it's actually the, the community, the world community as a whole, that pays price for that. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the nuclear disasters, they tend to be international. Again, Japan is on the island and the US is a big country, so that's, that's, that's a little bit different, but Chernobyl shows the, the international reach of those, of those disasters. And uh, uh, we, have, we have really no, no other choice but to strengthen that, that uh, agency that you have here in Vienna but also to think about the way in which one part of the agency doesn't cancel the efforts of the other because there is an inbuilt, inbuilt um, conflict of interest. Um, mm, I will probably stop here. I, I used all of my time. I hope I used it well. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Serhi, for this lecture that put the Chernobyl disaster in its bigger context, in its international context, in its political context, and across time and space. So we do have time for a few questions before we go downstairs for wine and cheese. So what we're going to do, what I would suggest we do, if you don't mind, is collect three questions. You can then take those, and then we can see if we have time for another round. Mm -hmm. So, Lydia. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ian Bates, and I'm a visiting yes. fellow here. Hello, we, we know each yeah. other, journalist based in Ukraine. Um, the question I want to ask is, how much of this danger and destruction do you think is innate in building these sorts of reactors? And I don't mean in terms of the technology. You know, what you're talking about is that there are political demands to get things done quickly. There are reasons to cut corners. There was a desire to, you know, produce something. And in that sort of environment, you're trying to move ahead quickly and you're trying to get rid of things. I'm thinking a little bit of Kate Brown's book, Plutopia, as well, where she's looking at different reactors, but where you have similar issues in the US and in the Soviet Union, where you reward people because it's dangerous work, you give them better creature comforts, uh, Pripyat is the same thing, but at the same time it seems like these accidents happen over and over again because of the pressure uh, and cutting corners to make it happen. So I'm curious what you, what you think about that. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, sure. oh, okay. Um, yeah, William Spiegelberger. I'm a lawyer here in uh, in Vienna. What what um, to what degree do you think the the current regime in Russia differs from the Soviet regime in its handling, say, of you know bad news? And we have two 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 example recent examples. I think one was Azorsk. That's Mayak. Well, yeah, the, the, there were again. We never figured out what happened there, and then there was, of course, in and the one in the north, in, uh, 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 yeah. by Arhangelsk. By, so, by Arhangelsk. The question is yes. simple: are, are we dealing with the same basic entity when it comes okay. to disasters, or, or have we made mm -hmm. progress or gotten okay. worse? Okay. Thank you for a great lecture. My name is Olha Martinuk. I mm. teach history at Kiev Polytechnic Institute. And um, I've been thinking about the legacy of Chernobyl in Ukraine and, and the development of nuclear infrastructure after Chernobyl. Ukraine is still a very nuclear country. 52% uh, of energy is produced at nuclear power stations. Uh, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapon, but uh, Ukraine never built its nuclear cycle. Ukraine does not extract uh, uranium, I Ukraine does not enrich uh, fuel, Ukraine does not have storages to store the nuclear waste, and Ukraine has been very much connected with Russia since the Soviet time, and it seems like it's, it, it has been connected after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and my question did did Ukraine actually learn a lesson from Chernobyl, or is it just a big um, a, a big um, exception that did not really influence the the way Ukraine develops its energy sector. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks. Uh, well, um, I'll, I'll start with the, with the accidents and nature of accidents, and there is big literature on that. Uh, one of the, of the uh, directions in which that literature goes is the so-called normal accidents. And the argument there is that in the complex enough systems, in particular technological systems, you really can't predict all eventuality. So these things will continue happening. So you, 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 you really have to try that stuff to see how it works. And in nuclear case, again, in, in the case of nuclear energy, if it's an explosion to, 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 to take that kind of risk. But as things become more and more complex, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, mm, mm, those things are almost inevitable. Uh, other, other line of argument is that, no, 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 that's the, the, the problem with all these uh, reactors that exploded was that the mantra of the 1950s was that the best reactor is the simple one and the cheapest one. And that's wrong. So there, the, 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 there are these disagreements. But the most, most people are talking about the uh, nuclear disaster, like any disaster, happening at the intersection of uh, nature or technology and, and human, human uh, uh, systems. And most of what people in sciences or in history deal, uh, we're dealing with that part of the, of the human component of the human component of the story. And that's what I, I was trying to a degree also to focus on. But again, if you, if you believe in normality of accidents in the complex systems, fasten your seat belts. Yeah, we are, we are for quite a ride. Um, <coughs> uh, now, regarding Russia, um, the, the short answer is I don't know. And the longer answer is that um, uh, my understanding is quite, quite superficial, is that things are, some things are changing, other things are staying the same. So, and what I will say is based basically on the, on the coverage of this accident near, uh, near Arkhangelsk. Uh, again, because of me working on Chernobyl, I was very interested in what, what, what I will see, what, what is being said by the government, what is being said by people, what, what is on TV. And one thing that I saw, oh my gosh, it's that they show on TV, there are the uh, uh, people who are dressed already in, in protective uniform, who care for the, for the uh, potential patients, people who were irradiated. They are driven to Moscow. The cameras are there showing how they are brought to the, to the uh, hospital to be dealt with. Very different from Chernobyl. No one had any equipment. No one had. And then there was com complete blackout in terms of the information, even when the, the uh, first firefighter, fighters who were dying they were burying them. They were actually trying to, to do that in secret with media being not present there and so on and so forth. So my first impression was, okay, a lot, a lot changed and changed for the better. But then later came, came reports that also those people who were brought to the hospitals by well-equipped people, they were left there with, with the personnel, with doctors, with uh, uh, nurses who were not trained, were not protected, who allegedly, I don't know, were irradiated or not, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to be irradiated from a, from a person who, who got uh, a higher dosage of, of radiation. Again, the case, the case with Zyorsk, really there was no straightforward explanation and answer what happened. So my overall uh, assessment on the basis of this, again, very, very fragmented information that certain things are changing. Uh, but I, I don't think that the, 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 the deep elements of, of the culture, which is of nuclear industry, which is Soviet, that they can be changed. And again, reaction that was in the media to the mini-series uh, was, uh, was uh, mm, again, I understand, quite negative. Uh, partially, uh, again, judging by, 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 the, by the coverage, partially because there was a concern that film on Chernobyl undermines the credibility of Rosatom, and Rosatom is competing with, the, uh, with uh, uh, the, the American and French firms and so on and so forth. So this is bad, bad news for the industry, which means bad news for Russia. So again, I, I think it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, but to a degree that there is a change, it's a change in the positive direction. Um, now, uh, with the, 
uh, with uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, whether Ukraine learned a lesson? No. No. Uh, you know that 52% of Ukrainian electricity comes from, from uh, nuclear. How many people in Ukraine know that? Uh, how many people actually discuss that? The, the way how Chernobyl functions in, in, Ukrainian, in Ukrainian memory, in Ukrainian society, it's basically my understanding is now in terms of the uh, significance it's, it's on the level with Holodomor, with, with uh, the Ukrainian famine of 1932-33. That's where the, 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 the entire nation mourns its, its victims and its, its uh, history, the, 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 the very tragic moments of history. But what that means is Chernobyl is in the past, right? That was an awful thing that was done in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was under the direction of Moscow. We, we, we turned the page, but we didn't turn the page. We first turned it and then unturned. So uh, the, the um, parliament uh, uh, that was uh, declared independence of Ukraine, that was also the parliament that voted for shutting down of a number of uh, constru uh, construction sites. There was no uh, nuclear power uh, plant built in Crimea. There were already works in preparation done. No in Chernihiv, the frozen, uh, uh, not in Chernihiv, in Chihirin. In Chihirin. There was um, mm, mm, uh, frozen construction of the nuclear reactors in Rivne and in other places, Khmelnytsky. But come early 1990s, a terrible economic situation. And the very same parliament, the very same people actually vote, vote the other way around. And that's, that's the question of safety versus economic, economic benefit or economic necessity in the conditions of Ukraine of, of the 1990s. And today we don't have, a, we have a lot about Chernobyl discussion, but about victimhood, right? Associated with 1986. Chernobyl is about the past, there is nothing about today or tomorrow, and that, 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 that has to be discussed, especially, especially in the current conditions. You mentioned, uh, again, that infrastructure is not the, there. Yeah, infra infrastructure was built during the Soviet times. The fact that there is a war between Russia and Ukraine means that the, uh, uh, at least for a while, the, 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 I don't know what is happening now, but there were reports that uh, the uh, spent fuel was not sent to Russia anymore, so it had to be sent somewhere else. There were discussions about, about uh, uh, turning the uh, um, exclusion zone into a dumping ground for the uh, nuclear waste from the entire Europe and the entire world. So the, 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 this, these things are, are, still, are, are still going on. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a major problem. Another, another uh, report was, it seems to me, one year ago, a year and a half, that there was one of the, of the uh, um, computer viruses, apparently according to report coming from Russia. So it knocked down uh, uh, some of the, of the equipment on the, on the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Russian. Sorry? A lot of equipment on Ukrainian nuclear power plants is Russian. Well, uh, again, I, 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 I I don't know whether it is related or not because again once once the virus is there it's very difficult to control it. So that's that's another big problem. And again we are we are in a conditions of uh, cyber warfare generally in the world whether the war is declared or not. And that's another very dangerous component that was not there when the nuclear nuclear industry was developing. If you can uh, sitting somewhere far away to cut off electricity from a nuclear power plant. And uh, uh, that's, that's apparently is possible uh, today. Then you get a nuclear, not exactly a nuclear bomb, but something pretty close to nuclear bomb in your backyard. So it is, it, it is, it is a, an issue of safety that wasn't there, let's say, five or six years ago, but it is now there uh, related to the, to the cyber warfare. All right, we have time for three more quick questions sure. and answers, and then we'll wrap up. Um, 
cultural manager from Basel. We had a festival on Chernobyl uh, on Ukraine in 2004. My question is towards your economic arguments or are there real rational arguments to say that in the end of the day a full cost picture is actually economic making sense or counting in a full cost calculation which includes eventualities and catastrophes is it still then uh, is it still a good idea for this world knowing that we need a lot of energy but is it a, is it a good way of looking for it there sure thanks Hello, I'm Walter Zimmerle and uh, I was very pleased by especially the beginning of your lecture and now the turn the discussion is taking because now you're reaching the second part of your title. Mm -hmm. You call it arrogance, being a philosopher I probably would call it hubris, uh, probably is the same thing and uh, I want to just um, start with a confession. Um, being a philosopher I owe a large part of my career to Chernobyl. Because in 86, when I was a very young professor of philosophy in Germany, my phone rang and the editors of the magazine The Spiegel mm -hmm. was on the phone and they asked me to write uh, the lead article in The Spiegel on Chernobyl, a philosophical lead article. And of course then I didn't really think about it of course they could have asked more senior persons. Why didn't they do that? Well, they were afraid they wouldn't write it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were probably right. So um, Now I know that. Yeah, yeah right. And uh, uh, the article was uh, um, titled um, a, farewell to, a Farewell to Responsibility. Mm -hmm. And the philosophically interesting question is, which my friend and colleague Ulrich Beck afterwards from, from more social sciences point of view called uh, the problem of the risk society. Um, is it regardless whether it was the Soviet Union or the US or Great Britain or whatever, is it possible to, to really apply our traditional notions of responsibility to, to a cat catastrophe like this? You said yourself that it's not a question where, you, where a single state could take responsibility. You know, the world community has to take responsibility. And I think that's exactly what the hubris part is. Mm -hmm. Because nobody thought probably about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think they are not even thinking about that today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thanks. Why don't you just take those two and then we'll wrap up. OK, sure. Um, well, in, in the way how I, I will be answering these questions, the, the, the two are related. And uh, one thing that uh, the, the, the actual cost of the, of the electricity that is produced by nuclear energy, um, it's, uh, overall it's a very expensive undertaking that could start there under particular conditions where the government was interested in, in uh, uh, doing that and building, in particular in the, in the Western world, the, the, uh, without government encouragement and guarantees, the private capital would not be investing into the industry that didn't know what, what the outcome was. So th th that was an industry both in the Soviet Union and the US and everywhere else highly subsidized. So when the argument is today that uh, while the, uh, in, in some places the renewables is cheaper than nuclear, that's because there are government uh, uh, tax breaks and other things. Probably this is right, but it's also uh, 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 right for the, for the uh, early age in the, in the nuclear industry, even more, more may be right. Some countries keep going with the nuclear because you need infrastructure, you need to train people, and this is related also to the, to the uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. At least that's, that's one of the arguments that is made. I don't know how true it is in, in, in case of the United Kingdom. So th there was also always a, go a government, which means money, public money, that was there. And uh, the, the cost is not limited just to that. The cost is also the cost of maintaining 
this uh, um, graveyard, the, the, this construction, multi-billion dollar construction, it's there only for 100 years. But still, even there, it has to be serviced. There have to be people. They have to go there. There is a, even if the, the nuclear plant is doing fine and good, once it comes to the end of its life, it's enormous cost to dismantle it and de, uh, de, de, de deactivate. And then nobody figured out what to do with the sp spent fuel. So the idea is, yes, we know technologically we can good put that into the rock somewhere, but the, the moment the, 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 the place to um, house that is built in the US, there is a mass, mass, no one wants to have that in their backyard. So, and we still don't know what to do with that. So that's, that's, uh, that's an issue there. And uh, finally, something that links these two questions together, but in, in a little bit different way, no, not, not philosophical, but the question of responsibility. Uh, maybe I will be off a billion or two, but uh, as far as I remember, the current claims uh, to uh, um, the, the uh, um, Escapes me now. The, the, the name of the uh, of the uh, Japanese company that was running, that was running the Fukushima. Uh, yes. So it's, it's of course went bankrupt a long time ago. Now it's the the Japanese taxpayers who are uh, picking up the bill. But the the um, claims related to the uh, harm done to the land, to the dislocation, to the, all these things. It seems to me two hundred billion dollars. This is the biggest the biggest claim that is there. So, the, the, which means that in the, in the, uh, at the end it's the taxpayers will have to decide whether they own or what do they do with those claims. Because it's not just about the bankruptcy of the company, it can be the bankruptcy of the country, or at least uh, the country can go through hardship. So, and uh, one of the arguments that is there that in the law abide in democratic society where such claims can be made, well, th that society can't afford really nuclear and nuclear accidents. Again, no one is, is, is uh, uh, suing anybody in the former Soviet Union, right? And, and probably that's, that's another great thing about authoritarian states, right? The, the law doesn't apply. But outside of that, it's a it's, it's, it's legal nightmare. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the kind of responsibility, again, that the, the individuals as a society are not prepared to deal with. And uh, again, I, ca I, can't, uh, I can't really uh, can respond to, 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 to your question in, in broader philosophical terms, but uh, I'll, I'll try to, to uh, uh, do that in, in the way how I understood the psychology of people who were involved in that. Uh, the, the, the one of the chapters in my book is called Denial. And uh, denial was there for a number of reasons uh, once the reactor exploded. For, for a long period of time, they refused to believe in that. And one part of the story was that they were really not taught the, the polytechnics or institutes that such things happened. There was not in the instructions. But another thing was, on my shift, the reactor exploded. And the world is coming to an end as far as I know that. What do I do with that? And I am responsible for that. So the, the only psychological refuge is actually deny what, what, what you even see. So there was a combination of these two things that came together. And again, that was certainly also a major factor in, uh, first of all, reacting to, 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 to the reality there, but also spreading the information. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. One more time. And let's all